Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today as we explore cross-sector solutions to building the next generation climate workforce. I'm Melissa Varga. I'm the Science Network Community and Partnerships Manager at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And at UCS, we have a vision to use science for the public good to solve some of the world's most pressing problems. In my role, I get to work with scientists, engineers, public health professionals, um, and technical experts at all different career levels, including students and recent graduates who are passionate about putting their expertise to work for equitable evidence-based solutions. These scientists, especially early career scientists, give me hope for a better future. The media often latches onto the darkest and worst side of an issue and climate change is no different. Don't get me wrong, the situation is dire. Marginalized and communities of color are the worst and first hit and immediate action is needed. But rarely do we hear about the innovative efforts that are actually working of communities coming together, embracing new approaches, scientists pulling from different disciplines and experimenting to come up with radical new solutions that help meet the moment that we're in. And even less do we get to hear about the process of building a foundation to support these innovative solutions, how we support the people to do this work, how we inspire and give them the tools they need to succeed in this fast changing world. Today, we're here to share some of these approaches that don't get much press and the essential behind the scenes work to invest in the people who will shape our future. Our panelists will share examples from academia and the nonprofit and private sectors about how investing in graduate education and workforce training is contributing to sustainable solutions for our communities. But first, we'll hear from Representative Suzanne Bonamici about her district's experience with climate impacts and how investing in new opportunities can create a multitude of societal and economic benefits for communities. Hello everyone, I'm Suzanne Bonamici. I represent Northwest Oregon in the US House. Thank you for inviting me to give opening remarks at Boston University's panel discussion on building the next generation climate workforce. This issue is critical to our future and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, albeit virtually. We know that climate change is caused by human activity and that it exacerbates extreme weather, natural disasters, sea level rise, glacier retreat, and resource insecurity. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we feel these effects acutely. Last summer, we experienced a deadly one in a thousand year extreme heat event, along with an exceptionally damaging fire season. Earlier this year, a coastal town in Northwest Oregon declared a state of emergency because of extreme flooding. The IPCC's latest assessment again made it clear we have no time to stall on climate action. Our only option moving forward is to implement sweeping adaptation measures and decarbonize as rapidly as possible. Fighting climate change is necessary and it will create tremendous societal benefits. Taking bold steps on climate will prevent further ecosystem degradation, mitigate natural disasters, and stave off deaths induced by air pollution, while also creating new economic opportunities. Energy Innovation recently reported that ambitious new clean energy policies will help create up to 1 million new jobs annually and spur hundreds of billions of dollars in clean energy investment. As these new opportunities emerge, it is critical that they be available to communities that have historically been left behind. As a result of systemic racism in housing, education, employment, and more, Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities have and continue to experience the worst effects of climate change. For example, Black Americans make up 13% of the U.S. population, yet 68% of Black Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. Researchers have also found that predominantly white counties experience an average increase in wealth through reinvestment after natural disasters, but predominantly non-white counties saw their wealth decrease. I serve on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, the Education and Labor Committee, and the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. In my role, I'm advocating for and helping to pass policies that will support a diverse 
and inclusive clean energy workforce. Improving the recruitment and retention of women, in particular non-white women, in the trades is one crucial way to bolster diversity in the clean energy workforce. In Oregon, we have a tremendous program, like Oregon Tradeswomen and others, that prepare women for careers in the trades through pre-apprenticeships. Despite the success of this program and others, funding has been extremely low. I'm encouraged that the House passed Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2022 uh, formally authorized funding for pre-apprenticeships, which will expand these life-changing programs and set participants up for success in apprenticeships and beyond. Earlier this year, I was appointed to the formal conference committee tasked with negotiating the Bipartisan Innovation Act. This legislation will reinvigorate our domestic manufacturing base, help lower costs, and bolster our scientific enterprise. The House passed a version of the legislation includes the National Apprenticeship Act reauthorization, as well as my Bipartisan Partners and Builds Acts, legislation that will expand paid on-the-job training opportunities to communities who have historically been left behind and to small and medium-sized businesses. The House passed version of the Bipartisan Innovation Act also includes the National Science Foundation for the Future Act. This comprehensive reauthorization of NSF includes many important provisions to, to enhance diversity in the STEM workforce. For example, the legislation would help expand the capacity of minority serving institutions to compete for NSF awards, support research in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the technology sector, and establish a chief diversity officer at NSF who would be charged with leading the foundation's strategic plan to expand NSF program diversity. NSF is instrumental in helping to train the next generation of climate scientists and researchers and supporting a more diverse and representative scientific workforce. So thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today and for your important work on these issues. I'm committed to working with you to further inclusive workforce outcomes for the clean energy sector and beyond. We are so grateful to Representative Bonamici for kicking off our discussion today. Now onto our panel. Each of our panelists will share lessons learned from their unique perspectives on this topic. And there will be time for questions at the end. So feel free to send those along throughout the presentation using the Q&A function. First, we'll hear from Dr. Pam Padilla. Dr. Padilla is the current president of SACNIS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. She's an active researcher and full professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of North Texas, where she is also the vice president of research and innovation. Welcome, Dr. Padilla. Great, thank you. I appreciate um, being invited to this and to include a really important scientific organization, which is SOCNUS, um, Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. I come from you, come to you from um, virtually from Denton, Texas, which is the land of the Kichi and Wichita nations. So SOCNIS is a 49 year old organization. We will be reaching our 50th anniversary. We have a very specific mission and vision. Um, it's an inclusive organization that really fosters the success of Chicano, Hispanic and Native Americans, indigenous communities within the STEM fields, all the way from undergraduate um, degree seeking students to professionals and leaders such as myself within STEM. Um, the vision is true diversity. And what I mean by that is that we are looking at a STEM workforce that represents what our country is. And at this moment, we do not have that. And this is vital and important to really solving um, really challenging issues. And um, again, bringing in the populations that are impacted by things such as climate change. We're not going to be able to really address this um, challenge unless we have individual communities that are truly impacted by this also at the table. Um, I've been involved with SOCNIS uh, for over 25 years since I was a student. And so that in itself shows the passion and energy that I have for the organization. And I'm gonna share a bit about what the organization is and how it as a nonprofit and scientific society can contribute to the solutions of climate change and environmental um, issues. 
And so within STEM, we have um, various gaps. We always need more STEM careers. We need a diverse workforce to be able to um, uh, seek solutions and we need creative solutions. And so really a foundation for solving these issues are institutional changes that's within higher ed and within the private sector, government, et cetera, so that we and develop a very culturally competent, inclusive and accepting STEM workforce so that then we bring forward the best in terms of individuals that can address these challenges. And uh, also multidisciplinary, multiple stakeholders within um, the various STEM degrees. Currently, we do not have a STEM workforce that reflects our society. Um, and that's something that is Sockness's goal. I'm gonna give you a couple of um, highlights in terms of numbers about Sockness. So we have a very broad support within the community. We have over um, close to 8,000 current members um, each year. We have uh, Sockness chapters that are within institutes. We have 135. A lot of them are within higher ed. And so that's a way in which at a local level, individuals of, um, that have similar interests can get together in terms of their STEM work and mentorship, et cetera. And then um, we, on our website, there is a job board, which is really important. We get hundreds of thousands of hits in terms of being able to uh, industry companies, uh, a higher ed, et cetera, can advertise their jobs as well as, um, and reach a very diverse workforce in terms of the students. We have many students, as you can see listed here, that are part of the organization. Uh, I'm part of a group of um, individuals who went through a leadership program. So we have over 300 plus um, STEM professionals that went through these programs. They've been supported by various individuals as well, well as Howard Hughes Medical Institution. And so again, reaching towards that goal of um, moving individuals through the STEM careers all the way up to leadership positions. I'm gonna talk a bit about our STEM conference, which um, uh, we have over four to 5,000 attendees. We have a YouTube channel, et cetera. And really this is on the back of many, we have a st small and mighty staff um, that is distributed across the country. We have a board of directors, but thousands of hours of volunteers that contribute to the success of this organization. So that really shows the passion. Um, our members by discipline are across the STEM fields. Uh, as you can see, the life sciences are a little bit larger and that's historically probably because we've had um, continued support from the National Institutes of Health, which we uh, are very appreciative of, but other um, federal agencies such as NSF, um, NASA, Department of Ed, et cetera, have provided support to the organization as well. But we know that bringing together individuals from diverse scientific fields is key to coming up with solutions. And so having an organization like Sockness that brings these individuals together very early in the career and also leaders like me um, and that are conducting research within the same space is paramount to being able to solve solutions, have discussions, think of, of unique and creative ways to um, address challenges within STEM. Uh, our membership it doesn't look like necessarily the membership of the STEM workforce, which I showed earlier. So we have a large percent of Chicano, Hispanic, Native American populations, as well as many other demographics. So that shows that we're very inclusive and we have individuals from all different um, backgrounds that want to contribute and be part of this organization, which we think is really important. Um, at the STEM um, conference, we call it NDI STEM, National Diversity in STEM Conference. We again have many individuals that are participating, but it's a balance between um, STEM symposiums, so science that's being talked about, really giving highlights to students presenting posters and oral presentations, as well as presentations that can focus on specific things. So in 2019, when we were in Hawaii, Hawaii we had very focused sessions just dedicated to um, environmental changes and climate change. And then we also balance it with professional development, how to write grants, how to write papers, et cetera, the things that are needed within particular areas of science. And so again, it's a space where you can talk about your science, but bring your culture to who you are and really helping individual scientists and students know that they can be their authentic self when they're within the scientific um, area. Mentorship is also a foundation. So you meet mentors and you become a mentor 
Um, uh, and so that building that national mentorship is so important for retention. And that's one of the main goals of SOCNIS is to be able to contribute along with all of the other institutes, um, higher ed, et cetera, to retain STEM workforce. And we've done studies with individuals who have, as undergraduates participated in SOCNIS, um, the overwhelming majority, almost 90% of them end up completing their PhD, their rather their undergraduate degree. And then over a third of them tend to go on and get into graduate school. That really says something about perhaps the way in which a scientific organization can help facilitate what's needed within higher ed, which is retention of these um, individuals within STEM. Of course, it's not done in a silo. We have many different partners, which I've already alluded to. Um, higher education institutes um, within our conference. We have um, hundreds of those that are um, um, exhibitors within our exhibition um, area. Federal government agencies, um, again, supporting us that I have here, like NIH and NSF, various industries, and then scientific societies. We talk with them as well. Example would be American Chemical Society. Um, and so uh, various societies that that we try to partner with as well as um, share spaces and, and have discussions. Uh, some of the corporate sponsors that are recent are just listed here. And that's one thing that uh, we're noticing is that there's a lot more companies that are seeking interactions with SOCNUS. And so one of the ways in which we have begun to um, address this is having a, a conference called CareerCon that's just focused on partnering with organizations that such as this to be able to um, work with them to know about our um, membership as well as for students to be able to meet with them. So it's sort of a process for being able to introduce students to particular um, industries. And so really to, in closing, I want to say that addressing climate change is a challenge, um, but it requires partnership and some organizations like SOCNIS, I think are key to this because we're already used to, we have decades of being able to bring people together from various um, industries and organizations to be able to have conversations. And so, and we have many different partners and, so, and, and foundational to what we do is to provide a place to discuss how to really develop an inclusive STEM workforce, which I think is needed to be able to solve some of these challenges. And then um, really recognizing that it is more than just the STEM field itself. We have to also recognize who the individuals are within those um, jobs. And then to recognize that their culture is important. The way that they come and look at solutions may give rise to more creative discussions. And so with that, I want to just thank um, the organizers and also here's some information. You can always find us on social media as well as our websites. So thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Padilla. And thank you to SACNES for really being a community that supports members and being their authentic selves in STEM wherever they are in their career journey. And I know that I'm really looking forward to the National Diversity in STEM Conference coming up in October. Uh, next, we will hear from Sean Jones. Sean is the Managing Director for Storage Development at Blue Wave, a leading Boston-based solar and energy storage developer and certified B Corps. He is also a co-chair of the Storage and New Technologies Committee at the Northeast Energy and Commerce Association. Welcome, Sean. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Wow, this is a great honor to be on this panel. Uh, it's a privilege to have such a diverse uh, panel of uh, uh, panelists. This is just, uh, I don't think this is the first time I've uh, had this much diversity on a panel, so I really appreciate that. Um, one thing I wanted to ground our uh, presentation on, uh, just kind of explaining how Blue Wave is structured and just how our, our approach to uh, developing a climate workforce is, is, is uh, oriented. Um, I do quite a bit of mentoring. So one uh, discussion point that uh, always starts uh, with is there's some variation of if you cannot see it, you cannot be it, that I have discussions with uh, young adults, teens, and uh, people who are just working out in, um, you know, in this industry. And as they're considering jobs and career paths, they typically see options that are very familiar to them, i.e. 
what their parents are doing, what their other friends are telling them are good career paths. And so as they look around, do they actually see themselves represented in the climate uh, industry, financial industry, entrepreneurial tracks? Or uh, do they have any peers that are, are really looking to uh, find out how to do the work and develop the skill sets to be able to thrive in these industries? Uh, and then I also challenge my uh, peers in the industry, do you typically look for people with diverse backgrounds who may not necessarily fit all of the parameters of the job descriptions that you have? Or do you just recruit at your alumni associations and just you know hire the same people? Uh, but just that's just my orientation and I really just wanna uh, just kind of ground that in our head of we need to look more and do more uh, in this environment. Next, please. So I want to orient everyone around who Blue Wave is. Um, clean energy is our mission. Uh, we want to uh, develop projects that are transparent. We have a high sense of uh, uh, sustainability and we're looking to improve the lives of everyone in the community. Uh, our mission is truly to revolutionize clean energy. And so when we provide our solar and storage solutions, we're looking at both a community component as well as an energy innovation component uh, and just really to do business that is good. Um, you know, we're a certified B Corp. Uh, next slide, please. We'll get a little bit more about that. Um, our vision and our values are really tied to uh, renewable energy and, and you know, transforming access uh, to it. Uh, and that includes, you know, we do community solar projects as well as uh, storage and it's all tied up with our values. You know, we want to do it right in the sense where everything we do, we want to make sure it's done with integrity. Um, it includes equity uh, and transparency. Uh, we want to do it together. We're very uh, respectful of the native communities that we engage with, uh, our collaborative work environment with the other industry partners, legislative uh, bodies, regulatory um, authorities. Uh, we like to do it boldly. Um, we are not fearful of uh, addressing the challenges. You know, there are certain communities, oh, it's really hard to do projects in those areas. There's probably a reason why. Um, and that doesn't discourage us uh, necessarily. Um, and sometimes there's always a cost involved in doing it, but we think that it's worth the effort if we can truly transform uh, the industry. And then we do it with a purpose. And part of our purpose is to truly transform uh, this world so they'll be around for generations. I'm a father of uh, three kids, youngest of 10, and I have 45 nephews and nieces. So very large, expansive uh, network of people I really want to take care of. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, Blue Wave is a, a certified B Corp. And so, um, you know, our process started in 2017, you know, with the first certification. Um, then we were recertified in 2020. Uh, and we're going through uh, a recertification process for 2023. And we are truly living uh, the B Corp life. You know, it's in our, our governance, it's in how we treat our employees. We have standards and codes of ethics and uh, conflict of interest that we do with all of our projects and make sure that uh, we're above board on everything. Uh, we have an annual impact report and statement of, you know, what have we done? Where were our expectations? who we've engaged with, uh, as well as how we've uh, been able to expand um, uh, the number of populations that we can uh, really support. Uh, we have a very strict anti-discrimination uh, policy. And in fact, we have an anti-racism action plan that we've been executing. Um, we have a very transparent performance review process. Um, and our hiring practices are what really drew me to uh, participate uh, in the BU Urban Program because as a mission-driven B Corp, and you know, we have a company full of environmentalists and just as human beings, um, we hold ourselves accountable for the impact of the work that we do. And to develop a workforce that truly celebrates both the diversity and the inclusivity of uh, society, we want to make sure that our teams are definitely from the communities that we're looking to impact with, and that when they join Blue Wave, it's an inclusive, a uh, fun, dynamic, challenging environment so that they really feel like they're part of the mission, they're part of the growth of our company, they're part of um, an extension of the work that we do 
So we do it boldly. Um, and we have a collaborative team process where even from our CEOs, my, you know, I'm a managing director, all the way to um, new interns and co-ops that join our uh, company, they have direct access to all of our processes, all of our technology, and uh, they're incorporated in a lot of our uh, business decisions. Next slide, please. Um, just to get a little bit more about our development process on how it's different than uh, other solar and storage developers. Um, I want to include this one that we typically focus on projects, as I mentioned, that are harder to develop. And so we're really um, doing what's a, a process called dual use. Um, uh, over 50% of our products in Massachusetts are uh, promoting dual use, where we are actually raising our solar panels uh, further up off the ground so that we can continue to have sheep, uh, crops, um, pollinators, different um, agricultural ventures that can continue on this land um, and not just uh, looking to clear land, uh, but to actually have it being part of the ecosystem. Uh, sheep make great mowers, so we're actually saving uh, costs there. And uh, a lot of the fencing it basically allows um, passage, so we're not really disturbing the natural home and, and habitat extremely of uh, uh, the animals that we're uh, uh, incorporating. Uh, Blue Wave also developed some of the first community solar projects in Massachusetts, uh, where uh, we now develop into a leader where some of the projects we built, we actually have offtake that allows uh, regular uh, energy purchasers who do not own solar panels on, them home, on their own homes, they can actually participate in our programs. Um, we're also working on uh, developing a few floating solar uh, projects where we are actually working with TL uh, international company to develop uh, solar on top of uh, ponds, reservoirs uh, in the different areas as well. And as I mentioned below, as part of our community solar um, projects, we include a low and moderate income uh, offtake uh, as part of it. And so we really want to you know, kind of enhance the activity that we do. Next slide, please. Um, just kind of want to bring it about to how we, we build up uh, 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 just this inclusivity uh, within our organization. Um, we extremely focused on our, our JEDI initiatives. We drafted our anti-action uh, plan in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Uh, we actually hired a JEDI consultant. We've been working with the uh, YW in Boston to lead two different uh, trainings within our staff, and we partner with a lot of our local uh, associations to make sure that you know we're part of this community um, because race and energy are you know inextricably connected, and community of colors uh, uh, definitely have a huge stake in our energy um, uh, outlook. And so, what we've been really focused on is just to make sure that uh, everyone understands that and they're able to participate uh, in those activities. Um, next slide, please. Um, specifically within Blue Wave and, and how we've been structured, what we really do, we have a volunteer program and we give back to the community. And so uh, we actually have three days out of every year that our staff uh, participates in either team or company-wide community service uh, activities. Um, and we're looking for 100% participation this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we also have a uh, charitable giving. And so each person at Blue Wave uh, has an allocation to uh, donate to an organization of their, chose, of their choosing. And uh, we also have corporate donations of, you know, we did it for Habitat for Humanity and we're looking for a few other opportunities this year. Next, please. Uh, and civic engagement is at the core of a lot of the work that we do. So that includes industry, uh, policy leadership with uh, a lot of the different uh, uh, organizations that we're involved in, including my work with the Northeast Energy Commerce Association. And then we're always actively out in the community uh, with all of our projects where we really want to make sure that everyone knows that we're a trans trans uh, uh, transparent business that really is part of that community. And that includes partnerships with UMass, uh, UMaine, and the uh, Solar Agricultural Services as well as this partnership with uh, BU Urban. We're also getting our recertification with the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and our supply chain is, is very diverse as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
last thing I wanted to close on is you don't need a science degree to tackle climate change. Uh, we have quite a few people in our organization um, that work with our accounting, legal policy, technology, and our sales teams as well. Um, and in closing, my information is on this last uh, slide in case you want to reach out to me. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Sean, for highlighting not just the valuable outcomes of the work that Blue Wave is doing in increasing access to renewable energy, but also how you're doing it and how you're living into those values and not just letting that value statement sit on a shelf. Um, and since you mentioned BU Urban, it's almost like we planned this. Uh, Dr. Pamela Templer is a professor at, in the Department of Biology at Boston University and is also the director of the Boston University Urban Graduate Program and a fellow of the Ecological Society of America. She and her lab at Boston University work on a wide range of topics, including the effects of climate change, air pollution, and urbanization on the functioning and health of forest ecosystem, ecosystems, and in turn, how these affect human health. She enjoys working with partners in government, non-government, and private sector institutions to tackle environmental challenges. Welcome, Dr. Templer. Thank you, Melissa, so much. Hello everyone, I'll echo what others have said before me to say what a privilege it is to be here today to talk with all of you. As Melissa said, I'm Pamela Templer and I'm a professor in the Department of Biology and Director of the Urban Program at Boston University. I'm really excited to share with you examples of how we can train students to prepare them for a variety of career paths that aim to tackle climate challenges. Following my talk, Yasmin Romidi, a graduate student in our program, will give a presentation to share her experiences um, and perspectives on training the future climate workforce. So just to give you some background, the National Science Foundation Research Traineeship Program, or NRT, which supports our program, was launched in 2014 to support graduate programs across the United States with five-year, $3 million grants. Each of the graduate programs integrate interdisciplinary research with graduate training. A main goal of the NRT program, as is shown to be flowing throughout this entire panel discussion, the importance of broadening participation by recruiting, mentoring, and championing trainees from underrepresented groups. Another main goal of the NRT program is to prepare graduate students for a variety of career paths. I'm showing you here a variety of climate relevant NRT programs across the United States from California to Connecticut, University of Maryland to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Detroit, Michigan, Utah, and everywhere in between. We find that graduate students across the country are hungry for interdisciplinary hands-on training that will enable them to contribute solutions to climate challenges, which really motivates them to learn essential skills, to do excellent work, and when they graduate, to get into the climate workforce. So Urban, our program here at Boston University, also known as the BU Graduate Program in Urban Biogeoscience and Environmental Health, was initiated with an NRT grant in 2017. We've admitted 40 PhD students across four cohorts to date, shown here, and we currently expect to admit another 12 PhD students this fall. So how does the BU Urban Program prepare students for the future climate workforce? Well, first, we, pride, we provide them with interdisciplinary and solutions-oriented training to tackle urban environmental challenges. They take coursework in both biogeoscience, environmental health, as well as statistics. For those of you not familiar with it, biogeoscience, as shown on the left side, is the study of how humans impact the environment. And environmental health is the part of the field of public health in which people study how changes in the environment affect the health of people. We see these as really integrated fields that work together incredibly well. So students work across these two main disciplines at the interface of air, water, and climate. And like I said, to tackle urban environmental challenges. Students are trained through workshops that provide them with hands-on training in city governance and science communication. And all of this training provides them to complete funded internships with government, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector while they're still enrolled in graduate school. So just to give you a sense of how these NRT programs work, I'm showing you the spring 2022 calendar for the BU Urban Program. And so just to give you some highlights, all of our first year students complete what we call the Urban Governance Series. They watch the City of Boston's mayoral State of the City Address. 
They complete a debrief with the director of Boston University's initiative on cities, Catherine Lusk. They complete a civic meeting observation on, the, on their own. They'll go downtown and, and watch a meeting. And they also complete individual meetings with stakeholders so they can get to know others and expand their professional network. This spring, we also had our Communicating Science Shaping Policy Workshop that we led in collaboration with BU's Step Up and Professional Development and Postdoctoral Affairs Office, as well as the Union of Concerned Scientists and Green Roots. We also had our professional networking fair, you can see Sean Jones in the picture, where we brought people together from across government, non-government, and private sector organizations so that students can learn directly from people about potential career paths they could follow. Of course, today we have our congressional briefing with all of you, so thank you for being here. And then finally, to cap out the last the spring semester, we're taking a group of students down to Washington DC next week for what we're calling our science policy trip, where the students will meet with congressional offices, think tanks, federal agency, advocacy groups, and more. And the hope is that trainees will take all of these skills they learn through courses and workshops and their experience working directly with policymakers, industry, nonprofits, to work with partner organizations and use it in their careers. So as I said, all trainees complete funded internships. They get to choose whether they work with the private sector like Sean Jones organization, government or non-governmental organizations. They gain course credit for a class they take during their internship that provides professional development and ensures internship success. We have a full-time program manager, Evan Curis, who's here with us today, who sources projects from organizations throughout our community um, as well as people he meets at different um, organizations like SACNIS. Um, Evan also guides his students through sourcing their own projects based on their connections and interests. And just to show you how effective these hands-on internships are for our PhD students, we found that internship hosts are motivated to take on our students because of their technical expertise, and it expands the capacity of the host organizations. Through our professional evaluation, we found that 100% of hosts say that the trainees met or exceeded expectations, and three quarters of the hosts said that trainees had a lasting impact beyond the lifetime of the internship. And you could see the variety of internship hosts that we've had to date. So in closing, I'll say that we really believe that graduate programs such as those funded by the National Science Foundation's Research Traineeship or NRT program that are be happening across the country are incredibly effective at training students in interdisciplinary, hands-on experiential education that they can use throughout their careers in a variety of ways. These programs tap into the energy that Melissa talked about at the beginning that many graduate students have who are motivated to learn both technical disciplinary skills as well as really important interdisciplinary skills so they can communicate effectively with others and enter the workforce and make a positive difference. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I love talking to new people, finding new connections. My email is at the bottom of the slide. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. And as promised, our final speaker is Yasmin Ramidi, a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environment at Boston University. Her research examines how urban populations adapt to increasing temperature exposures, the associated energy demand consequences of such adaptation, and how such adaptation moderates heat-related heat health outcomes. So welcome, Yasmin. Thank you, Melissa, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I'll just reiterate, it's an honor to be here among uh, all these inspiring panelists and all of you on Zoom. Thanks for everything that you guys do to support students and early career scientists such as myself. Uh, I get to give you just the brief overview of my experience with the urban program and how it has shaped um, my academic and professional development over the last couple of years. And then I'll just end with my thoughts about entering the job market in what feels like way too short a time. Next slide. So a little bit about me, I grew up in California, um, but growing up I wanted to be a diplomat and so I actually did my bachelor's degree in international relations at BU. And during this time I did a very formative internship uh, at Swiss Next Boston, which is the consulate of Switzerland, um, where I really worked on projects aimed at fostering connections between the two countries in science and education. And this is what really kind of, you know, planted the seed for, wow, um, I really like this sort of, you know, I want to combine science and policy, this is something I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, so, you know, I continued my education, I got a master's in Vienna, Austria, eventually worked my way back to DC, um, as, and I worked as a research associate at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, across several consensus studies that uh, span the climate and earth sciences. And this is the role that really pushed me to want to do a PhD, because I was sitting in these 
various committee meetings, listening to these academics talk about X, Y, Z research gaps. And I just kind of sat there and thought, hmm, uh, I'm very interested in these research questions. Why don't I try to do this research myself? Uh, next slide. So I came back to BU um, to do my PhD and I developed a research focus on climate, energy, and health. Uh, essentially how people in cities adapt to extreme heat, AKA use your air conditioning um, and how well that keeps them alive and healthy. And the urban program uh, re has really played a large role in shaping the direction of my research. Next slide, please. So turning to my urban internship, I was thrilled to get to work with Dr. Jalon White Newsom, uh, who will soon be starting a new role as Senior Director of Environmental Justice at the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, but for my internship, I worked in her strategic consulting firm, EG Squared, empowering a green environment and economy, uh, which is really focused on delivering people-centered solutions to transform communities. Uh, and I mainly worked on a project that was focused on understanding the role of buildings and environmental justice, across six case study cities in the US, uh, pictures of which you see here. Um, I'm not gonna get into too much specific detail, uh, but essentially what, I, essentially what I did was I spent a lot of time with greenhouse gas emissions data um, from buildings in these different cities. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, this is a map I created to help us understand what sort of data we were working with for the city of Los Angeles uh, in 2019. Um, but zooming out, you know, when I think about the main takeaways of my internship, I think that, you know, in addition to expanding my knowledge base and gaining new skills, it's a great opportunity outside of PhD training to see how to apply your skills in a way that make a difference. So in my case, for the clients that we were working with, but for others, maybe for whatever institution they're at or what community they're working with. Um, and I'd also like to highlight that it's a really great opportunity for mentorship that goes beyond the academic sphere and you know, beyond your advisors. Um, for me, I think it was really great to learn from Jalan and her diverse professional experience and really see how she thought about and approached different problems that were not necessarily the way I would think about things. Next slide, please. Um, but bringing this back to BU Urban and our topic today, I think the value of a program like BU Urban really comes in three major buckets. So the first would be community and community that wants to do things differently. This is a picture of me and my cohort when I first joined BU Urban. Um, you know, a PhD can be quite lonely. It can be quite isolating. Uh, the last few years of the COVID pandemic have done nothing to help with that feeling. Um, so I've really come to appreciate uh, the platform that Urban provides to you know, bring all of us trainees together and just even more generally to be around like-minded students that are thinking about all sorts of interdisciplinary issues, but just from you know, all sorts of different perspectives. Uh, next slide, please. And secondly, I alluded to this before, but Urban has really helped shape my research. Um, the requirement of a public health course is what even prompted me to start thinking about focusing on energy and heat adaptation and how that actually affects people's health. Um, this is just a slide of a recent paper I published with my main faculty advisor. Um, it's also really sh uh, helped shape the composition of my committee, as I'm essentially now co-advised by um, faculty in both earth and environment and environmental health, which is not entirely common, but it's very cool. Next slide, please. And then lastly, Pam talked about this a little bit, but you know, Urban provides a lot of training and opportunities for professional development. One of my main motivations to even pursue a PhD was to conduct policy relevant research and so for me, I think the urban governance and the science communication workshops really helped me um, think about what parts of my research were re most relevant and actionable for different audiences and how to really kind of communicate and translate my results. Uh, this panel is a great example of that. And I did a stakeholder interview with Sean Jones, who you just heard from last year, where we talked about, you know, what skills are appealing um, for private sector firms and how students like myself can really explore that job market after their degree. Um, of course, I'm just one voice and one experience, but I've benefited greatly from having the opportunity to um, participate in the urban program. Looking ahead, I'm very excited to be part of, you know, this next generation climate workforce. Uh, what's next for me, I don't exactly know, but I think that's a good thing because it just shows that because of the training and skills that opportunities I've had with urban, I feel like I have the tools and the resources to be a competitive applicant across different sectors. Um, all this to say I'm excited and I'm nervous and I'm ready. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you for listening. I look forward to answering any questions.
Thank you, Yasmin. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, as I said at the beginning, there is so much incredible innovative work that's happening behind the scenes to help develop this next generation climate workforce. And I know I feel very energized. Um, I have a few questions for our panel, but um, I also encourage our audience members to send in their questions through the Q&A function. Um, but just to get us started, I'll ask one to kick things off. Um, as extreme weather events and other climate impacts accelerate and become less predictable, we essentially have to expect the unexpected. So how are your different organizations preparing future workers for this less predictable future? I'm not sure who wants to start with that. I'll start. Um... Yeah, so one of the things that we're really focused on uh, our innovation with, with storage at this particular point is looking at longer duration storage. You know, typically when you're installing batteries connected to the grid, it's they're just large enough to absorb power from like a solar panel during the daytime. What we're trying to figure out is to look at four, six, 10 hours of storage, which is literally can absorb um, um, power for over, a specific, uh, you know, up an entire daytime hours, so they can be used during the nighttime. And so that's more resiliency, and it's one of those types of things where um, I've done some resiliency work in in, in Cal um, California and Hawaii, where if something uh, there's a bad storm um, during the daytime, it's all right. It's always at night when it's still uh, need air conditioning or you know hot water for showers. Uh, warmth or shelter. And so those are the type of longer duration products that we're looking at. Uh, and so preparing everyone to understand that the types of technology you have to fit exactly what the need is. And so um, resiliency, the world is, is, is changing. It's going to be longer and the, the grid is going to be out for longer periods of time. And Pam Templer, I think I saw you raise your hand. Sure, I'm happy to take it too. Um, similar to Sean's, I think we have to and as you said, expect the unexpected. So at least in training the, the next workforce, we look at this as really taking what others, I don't give myself credit for this, using what we call a T-based approach. So the idea being that if you provide students with deep disciplinary knowledge, so they get technical skills, but you also train them to communicate with others and work with people outside of their own discipline, I think that makes the students themselves quite resilient to both knowing how to attack a challenge technically, but also knowing how to pivot when necessary. So I think graduate programs as well as undergraduate programs that can do this and train our students with really deep knowledge that then can be applied to different scenarios is really important. And I can just add to that. And I, I think it's important to not only be able to communicate um, to others outside of the discipline, and so other STEM, but also within our community. So our family members that would be impacted. I think about the droughts in the Southwest and the res Navajo reservation that's in, that is addressing some of this um, water scarcity within certain areas of New Mexico and Arizona, California, et cetera. And so it's also that learning and knowledge and communicating to our family, um, our, our elders that are within the community, et cetera so that they understand and know maybe what they can, how they can participate. And a follow-up question to that, you know, it's not only climate change that is unpredictable, but also increasingly the federal policy landscape and not being sure which policies will gain enough support to pass through both houses at the federal level. Uh, what makes you optimistic that the federal government can make a difference in workforce development initiatives? Um, Dr. Padilla, I know you talked a lot about partnerships. Is there anything that's, you know, giving you hope uh, in terms of the partnerships right now? Yeah, they're uh, absolutely essential. Um, we depend so much on our government agencies and um, obviously they can move the needle and um, with, with dollars and as well as support. And so our, our funding agencies that are focused on STEM are critical to being able to address this, having that clear communication with the uh, um, individuals that are within those agencies and the scientific societies and the scientists that are doing the work. 
um, within higher ed and within businesses are so important. And so, um, uh, you know, I do think of that's an important area that we spend our government resource dollars really effectively. And so very positive about that. And we have to keep, keep doing it for as long as we can we need to address this. Yasmin or Pamela Templer, is there anything you wanna chime in about on, in terms of how you feel like BU Urban students are preparing for this unpredictable policy landscape? Yasmin, you wanna go first? Sure, I mean, I think that just sort of hits on my last point about the different types of training programs and like professional development opportunities that BU Urban offers. You know, I've learned in many ways to think, you know, how, what aspects of my research are important perhaps to different agencies, how, you know, and how you can flexibly think about that and then tweak your research or tweak the question and how you can really communicate in the best way. So it's really like show, teaching us how to be flexible and to be able to pivot um, while remaining true to like what we're interested in and our values. And, and I'll just add to that, that I think the partnerships we have with federal agencies are wonderful. So we know there's bipartisan support for STEM across our country. And I think the investment we see from the National Science Foundation and other agencies to support our students and training will only do more to prepare us for the future. For all these extreme weather events, we're already seeing um, other costly infrastructure issues that are coming with climate change that by training our students, they are learning how to work. <laughs> they are learning how to enter the workforce. Um, and I think, you know, to Melissa, your point early on, students right now are so hungry for solution-oriented training. They don't want to just learn science for science sake. That's super important. But I think even more important is learning how the science informs what decisions are made on the ground and how they themselves, either students during their internships like Yasmin, or immediately following graduation can enter this workforce and really make a difference. And to me, I, that makes me very optimistic seeing the energy that students have and that really is contagious for those of us who are working with them. Right. Uh, Melissa, you mind if I jump in on that one? Cause that was exactly the point uh, I wanted to make. Cause when Yasmin and I met, that's exactly what I uh, mentioned that um, a lot of, you know, PhD students, graduate students, and even, uh, elementary school kids now are, are really focused on outdoor solutions and climate uh, readiness and conservation. And so we really have to tap into uh, that mission driven um, uh, passion and not necessarily think, oh, well, you just have to do this thing that this indoor thing. Uh, and a lot of the work Yasmin was doing with you know, heat islands and just like really tangible things that people can feel and understand oh, there's the impact that my work do. So I feel proud that this is what I'm working on. Uh, and also there's been this focus on prioritization of deploying solutions in the communities that need it most. The one thing I really like about the uh, um, bipartisan infrastructure activities that are going on, it's let's prioritize the places where we see that there are failures in the structure and don't so much, uh, you know, more incentives to people with uh, electric vehicles and um, uh, luxury homes. You really want to deal with the, the outdoor uh, environment that we're all participating in. Yeah, let's drill into that a little bit more. We have a question from the audience. Um, what do you all see as the top legislative priorities to fulfill the goal of a diverse and resilient next generation climate workforce? Thank you, Jesse, for that question. Um, Sean, do you wanna take the first crack at that? Yeah, um, there's three things that I really like that I've seen with the Department of Energy and full disclosure, I used to manage, well, <laughs> over the last, 20 years, I managed a lot of uh, DOE projects. You know, the establishment of a um, environmental justice component within uh, the DOE and the focus on clean energy uh, deployment, I think is great because you don't have so much of the effort into nuclear power maintenance and, oh, you're gonna do solar and electric vehicles. And you know, I used to manage a combined heat and power uh, technical assistance partnership, uh, which is great, but you know, a lot of what we were focusing on was decarbonization. And you know, under the last administration, I'm out of it, I can say it, we couldn't even say the word decarbonization. 
you know, uh, as a DOE, I could not put on any slides or anything. And so that focus now of being able to get to the rooftops and yell, decarbonization, I think is something that's great. Um, and a lot of the, the jobs that I um, see of the future are predicated on, these are the environmental impacts. It's hot, it's wetter, we're gonna lose power. So we have to build up that infrastructure. Um, and the interest there, I think it's, there are a lot of people in, in Congress that were in the Peace Corps. Now we have the conservation and these clean energy corps. And I think that's a big movement that uh, we all need to be supportive of. Any of our other panelists wanna chime in on that? I could just add a little bit because I agree with everything Sean just said. I think any bipartisan support that we could tap into for people and infrastructure is the way to go is we're a country made up of people. And if we do whatever we can to improve conditions that make people's lives better, whether it's their health, their economics, their housing, is gonna benefit the environment. And so I think we just need to work together and find these commonalities. And I'm I, just like Sean, I'll echo, I'm so excited that these things are happening on the ground. And anything, of course, that we could do to train the students that are coming out to help solve these problems, I think is gonna be an investment for our whole country's future. Um, with that, I'll pivot to a question that was submitted in advance. Um, what types of skills, hard and soft, are increasingly important for our workforce to develop to address climate change? I mean, Yasmin, you can probably speak from a personal perspective if you want to go first on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a little strange for me because I'm coming from the like, okay, this is what we need. But, you know, um, I can just refer to my experience with my internship. You know, uh, Jalan really needed someone who's going to be able to work with big data and be able to manipulate it quickly, um, but also kind of be flexible in thinking creatively about how to um, successfully answer the questions that the client had. And there was a lot of focus on developing my GIS skills. Um, so I guess the first two are more like technical hard skills, but more soft skills is just being able to think flexibly and creatively. I guess I already, that's it, prior. <laughs> Sean? Wow. Um, I think building emotional intelligence is key. Because um, when I entered the industry, there weren't many company leaders that had any type of emotional intelligence and or understanding of um, what it means to be able to bring your authentic self to work. Uh, and so uh, I, I think I really think emotional intelligence as well as um, centering the live experience of, of your staff. I think we have to really understand, you know, the communities that everyone's coming from and to make sure that that's represented within their work. So I love what Satnas is doing and, and having these conferences because what Typically, it has happened in a lot of these situations. I've been the only person of color in any of these rooms, and I usually go to conferences to complain about being the only person of color in those rooms. And so to actually have companies that allow me to understand, you know, I grew up in a um, uh, environmental justice community that had a lot of impacts, and I have been able to channel all of that into the work that I do. There's so many other folks like me that can do that same work if we just figure out how to tap into it. Emotional intelligence, making sure that they're prepared for the work and the rigor of what they're going to be doing. Because everyone understands what a doctor does. Everyone understands uh, what lawyers and to an extent engineers. But the climate work, I don't think people still understand what we actually do. And so uh, we have to bring a little bit more transparency to our process so they understand what the skills are which is GIS is great. I, I love that Yasmin's doing it. I have a GIS specialist on my team. I really love it. Uh, Dr. Padilla, do you want the final word? Sure, I'll, I'll echo again what I've been saying is partnership and working as, as a very cohesive and functional teams. That's how we're gonna solve things. So bringing individuals together with those technical um, skill sets that they each have, and then, um, and then that emotional, intelligence so that the, it's a functional team or learning how to um, get through challenges that they would have, have critical conversations, being able to come up with ways to move forward. Those are the skill sets that I think can make or break teams. 
Um, it's not the technical skill sets. We, you know, will continue to teach those within higher ed, and they're so important to bring more into STEM. But we have to layer it with these um, personal type of skill sets so that that solutions can come together from teams. That's that cultural awareness as well. Absolutely. I think that's a great place to close. Um, there's so much to be optimistic about, and yet still so much more work to do as well. Um, so thank you all for your time and attention today. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, follow us on social media if you'd like to learn more about these initiatives. Um, again, thank you for joining. Thank you for hosting the list as well. Thank you everyone for being here today. This has been wonderful. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks to everyone.